Happy Land, where maybe we can find some self-confidence for you, you jackwagon! Coming to you live from his padded cell high atop Bethel Church, the most heralded, the most despised talk show in all of human history. This is the talk show Hell Hates. This is Pastor Mike Online. approved unto God, workmen that need not be ashamed. I believe in Bible study, Bible knowledge, Bible understanding, Bible wisdom. Um, it's, it's a gift that God gives us, and He gives that gift freely. He gives it to the clergy and the layman alike. It doesn't matter. If you didn't, if you if you went to Bible college or didn't go to Bible college, or seminary, or a Bible institute, or a home school course, or whatever, all that matters is that you believe that every word of God is pure, and you trust that book, you read that book, you meditate on those words. Think on these things, the Apostle Paul said. This is why I always, you know, end the show with this right here. Think Bible. This is, this is why. This is how we're to think when we see things going on in the world. We're to think Bible. When we watch a YouTube video, and there's, there's so much, people, there is so much garbage on YouTube. There is so much. Um, and 80% of it, uh, I, I don't know if you are aware of this, people who have YouTube accounts have the opportunity to monetize their videos. I don't. I have the opportunity I have almost no strikes against me with YouTube. I follow YouTube's rules. I don't use copyrighted material. I and I, but I'm in good standing with YouTube, and I have the ability to monetize my video. I choose not to do that. YouTube gives people the chance to monetize videos, which means the more people that watch their videos the more money they make. And I watched a, 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 I'll never get me 15 minutes back. A video that uh, was supposedly about Anthony Bourdain, uh, the Food Network guy that committed suicide. Now there's this theory floating around on the internet that he was, he was struck down by the Illuminati. And so there is a video, and I forgot the exact title, but it was, you know, Anthony Bourdain, uh, Illuminati killed him or whatever, and it was, it was meant to draw you in and entice you to this idea that the Illuminati somehow owned Anthony Bourdain, and the story of his suicide is a myth. The Illuminati really had him killed. They, they put him out in the pasture. Uh, for some unknown reason. So I'm, I'm going, okay, I wonder what they got to say. I watched this video. There was nothing in it about Anthony Bourdain having a connection with any group called the Illuminati or any group called anything for that matter. There was nothing presented in it that revealed or shed light on his alleged suicide or that it was a it was a murder plot or whatever. It was it was bizarre stuff. And even one of the comments said, Okay, where is this thing about the Illuminati killing Anthony Bourdain? 
but they watched it too. And it, and it had like, I don't know, 60, 70,000 views just in a matter of a couple days. And I'm going, how do they get away with this? And, but that's, that's a lot of what's on YouTube now. But then you have the YouTube videos that they actually talk about what the title says they're talking about, but what they're saying is garbage. It's not true. It's, it's a lot of unverified, unsubstantiated rumors. It's these professional YouTubers who, for, they think that they know the goods on everything that's going on in the world. And people fall for this stuff, and it's just a lot of garbage. And, folks, now is the time to know truth. And the only truth there is that can be known is Bible truth. There is no truth if there is no Bible truth. And um, that was uh, the beginning of our radio ministry in Kenya. It started out here locally. We started a pro... A, uh, a streaming radio channel called Bible Truth Radio. Then when my son-in-law approached me about, you know, going to Kenya and setting up a radio station, we, we called it KBTR, Kenya Bible Truth Radio. Uh, there is the little the logo for it down there, Watchman FM, KBTR, Kenya Radio. But anyway, where's it going with this? Anyway, there is no truth. If there is, if there is not Bible truth, and so what I want to do is I want to I want to start a study of how to how to know what the Bible says, how to understand what the Bible says, uh, the Bible as the sure word of prophecy. If the Bible says it, it's true. If the Bible doesn't say it, it's not true. Don't you don't. You don't believe it. You don't have to believe it. You can believe it if you want to, but it's not there. And um, I just want to—I want to encourage people to open up their Bible, to read it more, to meditate on it more, to think on these things more, to know it more, so that if you're if you're reading somebody's blog and they lay out some kind of nonsense. You know the Bible, and you read the article and say, that article's nonsense. That is not what the Bible says. Because I would, I would venture to, I'm just, just a guess here, but I would say that for every truthful video there is on YouTube, I would, I would say there's probably 500 videos that boast about being true, and they're nothing but garbage and lies and uh, guesses and uh, suppositions and make-believe scenarios or whatever, like Anthony Bourdain somehow being in contract with the Illuminati, and he went rogue, and they had him kill. Who knows that? Who knows that? And what difference does it make? So anyway, let know truth. And if you're going to read the Bible, and you're going to want to gain knowledge from the Bible, there are some very important rules. And these rules matter. And the, the first rule of knowing Understanding, gaining wisdom from, is believing that what you're reading, God actually said those words. And God is not a man that he should lie. And when I say God, I'm referring to the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. That's what I'm referring to. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. So, 
If you want to know Bible truth, you want to know Bible prophecy, you want to know doctrine, or you want, there's, let's say there's an area of your life that there's, there's something troubling you, there's something not right in your life, something's going bad, and you want to know how God is going to bring you out of this, or you want to trust God, you want to you want to know that this thing is in God's hand, and God is going to do exactly what He said He's going to do. Then you have got to believe that book. You've got to believe the words that they are the Word of God, that they are incorruptible, and that the very words you're reading in the King James Version, King James Bible, it is right. If there's not one word that's wrong in this book, because remember what Satan's plan was, how he worked. And that's what I was getting at in the, the little preview of uh, the Seed Part 3, the Watchman Broadcast that's out this week. Satan's plan, and Paul referenced this in 2 Corinthians 11. Uh, and he said, for, he said, I'm jealous of you with a godly jealousy, for I'm about you one husband. But he said, I, I'm troubled as, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupt, corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. And he referenced how Satan deceived Eve. The first thing he did was question the authenticity and the authority of God's Word. Yea, hath God said, you should not even eat of every uh, tree that's in the that's in the garden. I'm, I'm messing it up already. Let me let me read it word for word, or verbatim. That way we can get it right here. He starts out questioning God's word. Yea, hath God said, um, "You shall not eat of every tree of the garden." Did God really say that? So in a person's mind. And they can get this from the internet. They can get it from YouTube. They can get it because they attended a, a, a Bible college of some kind or whatever, or a seminary for a little while. Or they can get it from their pulpit. Whoever's teaching behind the pulpit, they can get it from that. They can get this idea that you can't believe what it is that you're reading on the pages of your Bible. You can't believe that because. We, we're the scholars, and we, we're saying that some of those words are not true. That's what Satan said. And I, I would dare you, I would dare you to show me one place in the Bible where God said that you don't have to believe His Word. That God said that not all the verses of the Bible would be preserved. Where God said that some of His words would pass away. I dare you. I challenge you. I would almost put up money for it. I could. I could put out money and say, I'll give you $100 if you can show me in the Bible where God said that this word is corrupt or would ever corrupt or would ever be corrupted. And that the Bible says you, you can't really believe everything that the written record of the Word of God says. God never said that. Satan does. So when you hear it from the pulpit, now, in the King James it says this, but a, a, a better translation is, or the original Greek says this, your problem is you don't know Greek and Hebrew and there's a 90% chance that the guy behind the pulpit doesn't know it either. He looks it up in a concordance. And I know how it works. I did it. So anyway, yea, have God said, meaning we're not certain that God really said this. Like in these new Bibles where it says, you know, where 1 John 5-7 is supposed to be. They'll take it out, and then they'll put a little mark, and you look at the bottom of the page, and that little mark will say, the earliest and best manuscripts do not contain 1 John 5, 7. You know what they're telling you? You don't have to believe that if you don't want to. We think that it shouldn't be in the Bible, so we took it out. You don't have to believe it if you don't want to. That's yea, have God said. 
Yea, as God said. And then he said, ye shall not surely die. Which was a direct contradiction to what God said. God said, ye shall surely die. Satan said, ye shall not surely die. So he just added one word in there. In adding one word to what God said, he directly contradicted exactly what God said. Then, once he gets people to the point to where they don't believe everything the Bible says, then Satan comes in with his counterfeit, with his alternative. For God just knows that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be in God, knowing good and evil. That's his counterfeit. And he can't, if, if you believe the Bible and are inclined to keep believing the Bible, then the devil cannot come up to you and say, I have another counterfeit Bible here. It's better. You'll go, no, thank you. I already have the Bible. I don't need what you've got. Get out. Get me behind me, Satan. But if he can question the authenticity, the authority of God's Word, if he can directly contradict God's Word and get you to believe it, then it's easy for him to, for him to substitute what he says or his doctrine in the place of what God says. And so the bottom line is, if you want to know What's going on in these last days? If you want to know prophecy, if you want to know what's happening in your life or in your marriage or in your family, if you want to know these things, God will reveal them to you, but He'll reveal them to you through His Word, through His written Word, the Bible, and no other place. You're going to get it. If you're going to get it, you're going to get it from the Bible. Now, there might be second witnesses out there, but the Bible is the primary witness of what God wants you to know. And so it starts out with rule number one. And rule number one is there are no mistakes in the Bible. That's rule number one. And rule number two is if someone shows you a mistake, refer to rule number one. There are no mistakes. That's biblical. Where do I get that from? I get that from... Let's see here. Oh, let's see here. Second Peter, or First Peter chapter 2. Uh, we know that the Bible, the Word of God, is quick and powerful. Sharper than any two edges. So we know that the Bible is the living Word. That it lives and abides with us forever. And um, 1 Peter chapter 2 says, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the Word that you may grow thereby, if so be you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. I've tasted that. It's pretty good. The Lord is gracious to whom coming as into a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore, it also it is contained in the Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious. My Bible is precious to me. It's dear to me. I love it. I heed it. I believe it. I try to live it. It corrects me. It changes me. I don't change it. It changes me. It's changed my thinking. It's changed my doctrine. It's changed my prophetic outlook. It's changed my eschatology. And it will change you if you will believe it. But what happens is men are more interested in what they say than they are what God says. And when what they say contradicts what God says, then they go back and they correct God. Like the Swagger Expositor Study Bible. I have it back there. They correct God a thousand times if they do it once. 
The one to you, therefore, which believe in presence, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. So the stone of stumbling is the Bible. And you have the builders of the modern church building with some other thing other than the Word of God. They've rejected the chief cornerstone, which is elect and precious. They rejected it. And so now they're building without it because they stumbled at the Word. They didn't, they didn't agree that the Bible was right. They didn't. They disagreed totally that this Bible is perfect, and so they disallowed it. How many churches do you know of that only use the King James Bible and no other book? They're becoming very difficult to find. Very difficult. That's because the builders would rather build upon the Rick Warren nonsense um, or the New Apostolic Reformation or the Hebrew root or anything or these new Bibles or anything else other than building upon the Word of God and building with the Word of God. So, number one, you've got to believe that what the Bible says is true and it's not subject to your interpretation. The Bible is not subject to man in any way. Man must be subject to God's Word. In other words, man has got the authority over what God says in His Word. God's Word is authority over what man is and what man thinks. And even if a man lives his entire life in rebellion to the Word of God, at the end of his life, he is going to submit to the Word of God because it's going to be the Word that judges him. The infallible, incorruptible Word that judges him. And so, you've got to believe that what you're reading is every Word of God and every Word of God is pure. It's been refined. It's been tried. It's been purified seven times in a furnace of earth. God said He would keep them. God said He would preserve them. God said He would translate them. God, God made it easy for us to just pick up a Bible, read it, and believe that that's what God said. Exodus 20, verse 1. And God spake all these words, say it. Then it goes on with the Ten Commandments. Do you believe? Exodus 20, verse 1. Do you believe that God spake all those words? That was the question that the Holy Ghost asked me one day. Mike, do you believe that? And I said, yeah, I do. I do. And from that time forward, I had it settled in my mind that I was never, ever again going to try to go to the Greek or Hebrew to retranslate the Bible and say to people, a better translation than the King James is what I said. I would never do that again, and I never have. I quit it. I gave up. And I just, I would rather believe the words that are on the page and let, and then get wisdom from those words than to disallow those words and try to get wisdom from some other source, like a concordance or somebody on the internet or somebody's commentary or whatever. So, do you believe God's word? And what I'm going to do now is I'm, I'm just going to I'm going to spend some time encouraging you that you can believe what God said. You can know for a certainty that what your Bible says is right 100 percent of the time. Deuteronomy 29:29. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever that we may do, notice that, all the words of this law. Now, if some of the words from the original manuscript, if some of the words have been lost, how can we do all the words of this law? 
how can God hold us accountable for not performing all the words if all the words are not present, if we don't know what all the words are? But he's plainly revealing here that God reveals things to us and to our children from the words of this law, or in other words, the words that are on the... And it, when the Bible says law, let me tell you something. There is no valid law if it's not written down. There is no valid law anywhere if it's not written. Courts. Courts of law. Every judge is going to have within arm's reach of either his chamber or his bench that he sits in in court. He's going to have within arm's reach the book of the law, like the revised statutes of the state of Missouri or the statutes of the United States of America or whatever. He's going to have within arm's reach books that have the laws, the statutes, the codes, because he can't judge without those words. He must judge and rule according to the written law. There is no law if it's not written down. So the secret things belong to those, but those things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever. Psalm 25, 14, the secret of the Lord is with them that fear Him, and He will show them His covenant. So now we find another rule here. The fear of the Lord is one of the seven spirits of God. So the manifestation of the fear of the Lord, and you'll hear somebody say, well, it doesn't really mean fear of God. Uh, yeah, it does. Yep. It sure does. I fear the Lord like I feared my mother and father when I did something wrong, and I didn't want them to find out about it. The reason why I did not want my mom and dad to find out some of the things that I did is because I was afraid of what they were going to do to me because they'd done it before. That fear. It's a legitimate fear. It is the fear that a child has for his parents that if he does something wrong, he's going to get blistered over it. And so when you fear the Lord, and God knows that, God does not have a problem sitting you down and showing you secret things mysteries that will be revealed. God doesn't have a problem with that. A time in my life when I was rebellious to the Lord, God didn't show me anything. But when God brought me to submission, laid me out, chastised me, something awful, when God did that, then, that's when God began to show me things. Secret things. Mysteries were revealed through the pages of the Word. Proverbs 3.32, For the froward is an abomination to the Lord, that His secret is with the righteous. What does it mean by the word righteous? It means those upon whom the righteousness of God has been, um, what's the word, um, Abraham believed God that was imputed in the end righteousness. So, to whom the righteousness of God has been imputed or given to, then God can read, if you fear the Lord and God has clothed you with His righteousness, then and only then is God going to reveal these secret things to you. I, you hear me mention Manly Hall quite a bit, and Albert Pike and so on. Albert Pike read the Bible. Manley Hall read the Bible. Their problem is they were both lost. They're both reprobates. And God never led those two men to believing that his Bible was true. Because when you read these guys, when you read Manley Hall, he'll tell you, yes, the Bible is a great book, but the Bible is misunderstood by the pastors and by the laity of the churches. They don't understand that and it has secret meanings in it. And those meanings are only revealed to those who can unlock the secrets of this and that and the other. In other words, 
The Bible is wrong in so many places, but it does have certain truths in them that are mysteries. That's what Manly Hall said, that's what Albert Pike said. Those men did not know Jesus as their Savior. They did not have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in them. And so to them, the Bible was full of errors and it was misunderstood. God never told them anything true. They went to their grave believing the lies of the mystery doctrine that they were taught. That's how they died. Proverbs 15, 29, The Lord is far from the wicked. Oh, I like this. But He heareth the prayer of the righteous. But God's far away from the wicked. But if you have been clothed with the righteousness of Christ, when you pray, God hears that prayer. When you pray things like Jeremiah 33, 3, call unto me, and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things that thou knowest not. God will hear that prayer. And God may give it to you right then. God may wait a day or a week or a month or a year, or God may wait may wait five years or ten years. I've been I've been uh, doing this ministry since 2009, but um, I had been studying the book, The Sure Word of Prophecy, since uh, around November of 1997 was when God called me into this. So all through 98, 99, 2000, and all through the off, and then the teens, and I am still, so it's been about 20 years since late 1997, 1998, it's been about 20 years now that I've been studying the Bible as a sure word of prophecy. And I can tell you, I'm not done learning things. There's something that I am, I mean, I have devoted a lot of my time, I mentioned it last week, something new that God has shown me from His Word. And I've been studying it intensely. I want to understand it enough to be able to speak it. I was trying to tell somebody yesterday a little bit about it, and I was having a hard time. It's hard to put in words right now. I'm still studying. I'm still learning. And what drives me and compels me is that I don't know everything, but I want to know. I want to know more than what I know now. And... It satisfies two things in me. Number one, I have a thirst for knowledge and understanding. But number two, I have a desire to tell everybody what it is that God has shown me. And I'm glad that I get the opportunity Sunday morning, Sunday night, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, back again Sunday morning, I get the opportunity to tell everything that I know that God has shown me. So you just ask God. Ask God for wisdom. He'll give it to you. He's liberal with His wisdom. Ask God for mercy. He'll hear that prayer. Colossians 3.10 That's put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of Him that created Him. I've made this statement before. When the Bereans searched the Scriptures, they were searching through rolled up scrolls large, big volumes of the Old Testament books, reading them verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book. It would have taken them months, if not years, to go through the Old Testament to see whether or not what Paul and Peter and James and John were telling these guys were true. But they wanted it. They said, Guys, sounds good. We're going to read it from the Scriptures. And if it's not the Scriptures, we don't believe you. And God blessed the Bereans. So right now, we have it so easy. All we have to do is, like, okay, here I am looking at the word silver. I want to understand what silver is in the Bible and how God uses this idea of silver. That's what, I, that's what I've been studying. That's a clue. That's a hint at where I'm going. Okay? And so, 
here it is mentioned 320 times in the Bible. So all I have to do is look at every verse in the Bible that uses the word silver. Some 320 verses. And, I, and it's not going to take long at all to do that matter of hours. I can have that study done in a matter of hours. And yet, there is more ignorance of the Word of God now than there ever has been. Especially out of church people. They don't have a clue what the Bible says. They don't want to know what the Bible says. To them, it doesn't really matter. It's irrelevant. They're looking for experiences. They're looking to be catered to in a church. They're looking to be well-pampered. They're looking for everybody to do everything. For, it's like the church welfare system. They're counting on the pastor to do all the Bible reading for them, and they just dish it out to them. They care nothing about the Word of God, and they'll die in ignorance. When God saves a man, He makes him a new creature, and that new creature is renewed in knowledge. God puts it in the heart of those that are truly His who want to know what God says. Then you get ridiculed. You get ridiculed by the likes of Rick Warren and all of these other megachurch pastors and megachurch wannabe pastors who downplay people who do Bible studies or have Bible study time. They mock and they scorn the people who spend hours studying the Scriptures where we're out doing the Bible and all you're doing reading the Bible. You see, they always pit their works against your faith. That's how you can tell who is and who isn't. They emphasize works, they emphasize doing, and they mock those who attend Bible study or who just spend time personally studying the Word of God. They mock them. But the Bible tells us plainly that when we have a new man in us, there is a desire to know God. To know God, to know who He is, what He is, what He is not, to know what He says. And to know those doctrines that the Bible so eloquently and... Uh, I can't think of another word here. But the way the Bible lays out doctrine and spells it out in, in no uncertain terms, God just puts it in you. You have a thirst for knowledge. You want to know. That's that new man on the inside of you being renewed after knowledge. Isaiah 45, 19. This is in contrast to every mystery religion in the world. God said, I have not spoken in secret in a dark place of the earth. I said not unto the seed of Jacob, seek ye me in vain. I, the Lord, speak righteousness. I declare things that are right. Now, when he said, I've not spoken in secret, already in Isaiah's day, all in Babylon, in Samaria, even in the time of Christ, and even up till now, there are mystery religions, secret societies, or, excuse me, societies with secrets. And you can read their books, and you can attend their seminars, and you can listen to their lectures, and you'll never get what it is they're talking about because they speak in symbols, they speak in metaphors, they speak in allegories, but they don't tell you what those allegories mean. One of the, to me, one of the greatest things that Jesus did was when he spoke a parable, he then sat down with his disciples and said, I know I spoke to you a parable, but I'm going to show you what the parable means. Instead of speaking an allegory or a parable and then saying, you may or may not ever figure that out, but I'm not telling you what it really means, like Albert Pike did with Morals and Dogma, or any other Masonic literature, or what uh, Blavatsky wrote, The Secret Doctrine, or the writings of Aleister Crowley, or any of these others. A cultist, mystic, the writings of 
of Jewish rabbis writing about the Zohar and the doctrine of Kabbalah, you will never in a million years understand even the language of how these guys write when they're talking about the mysteries and the secrets of the Kabbalah. See, the, the Jews are taught and they teach their own. They say that Moses didn't actually go to Mount Sinai twice. He went to Mount Sinai three times. The first two times, God gives him the written Torah. And Moses comes down with the writing of God on those two tablets. But then they say the third time that Moses, and Moses read to the people what God said. He read it to everybody, and they agreed to it. But then they say Moses goes up to Mount Sinai, comes back down the third time. This time, he's not carrying anything in his hand. This time, he has no book. For God delivered to him secret teachings and instructed Moses, Moses, you can't tell everybody what I just told you. You can only reveal it to those trusted members of your inner circle, and they must swear an oath that they can never tell the common man what it was that you learned from me on Mount Sinai. Remember, that's the devil. He has a secret doctrine that he wants to give people and make them think that they know the truth. All the while, they're believing a lie. And it has to do with the Antichrist. They're going to they're gonna believe that they're worshiping Jesus, but he's not Jesus. He's the opposite of Jesus. But that's what they're going to think. So in contrast to the Masonic laws, in contrast to the Kabbalah, in contrast to the Roman Catholic Church, where they talk about the mystery of the Eucharist, and the mystery of the priesthood, and the mystery of baptism, and the mystery of this, and the mystery of that, where everything is a mystery, and you can't know what God said in His Word. You must get it from us, the priests. We're the, we're the elevated men who know the secrets of God, but you puny people down in the pews, you don't know that, and you never will. And yet God says, I'm not spoken in secret. Deuteronomy 30, verse 11, For this commandment which I command thee this day, it is not hidden from thee, neither is it far off. Remember, the Kabbalists teach that Moses received an unwritten Torah, an unwritten law. And Moses was not allowed to reveal that to anybody except a very select group of Jews. Okay? And they had to swear that they were never going to reveal that as long as they lived, but pass it down to their disciples and so on. And yet God is saying, this commandment which I command you to say, it's not hidden from me. Neither is it far off. It is not in heaven that thou should have say, who shall go up for us to heaven and bring it unto us that we may hear it and do it? You know that passage that says, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven? You know what I've heard people say? People that despise the King James Bible. Because we say it's perfect. And we use the verse that says, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. And they say, yeah, but we believe that God's word in heaven is pure. We just don't believe that God's word on earth is pure. Mm. What does that verse say? For this commandment which I command thee to say, it is not hidden from thee, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven, but thou shouldest say, who shall go up for us to heaven and bring it unto us, that we may hear it and do it? God said, the word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth. And Paul said, that is the word of faith which we preach. God did not write out his words, his doctrines, and then hide them somewhere so that mortal men could not know it. It's a lie. It's a big lie. Neither is it beyond the sea that thou shouldest say, Who shall go over the sea for us and bring it unto us that we may hear it and do it? But the word is very nigh unto thee, and in thy mouth and in thy heart that thou mayest do it. If God is going to require it of you, then God is also obligated to make it plain for you to do. God is not asking you to do something 
that is not written plainly in His Word. He's not going to demand that. So God is obligated, just like just like in court, if they're going to there's a there's a legal thing in America called a writ of habeas corpus. And what it what it is, what it means is, is that if the police arrest you, they have 24 hours to hold you. And during that 24 hours, they must write out for you on paper. Paper is very important. They must write it out on paper exactly what you're charged with, the accusation that you violated Municipal Code, Section 8, Paragraph 4, Verse 9. Specifically, you violated this specific written law. If they don't produce that, they have to let you go. You have to have a writ of habeas corpus. You have to, it has to be written down what exact law, in what book, in what section, and what code number, and what chapter number, what division, or whatever, the exact code that they say you violated. You can't get accused if it's not written in the law book. You cannot get accused if it's not written there. So God said, I gave you the word. I gave, I made it real close to you. It's even in your mouth that you have to do it. Isaiah 48, 16. Come, come ye near unto me. Hear you this. I've not spoken in secret from the beginning, from the time that it was. There am I. And now the Lord God in His Spirit has sent me. I was uh, looking at a book last night written by a Jewish rabbi about the Kabbalah. And it focuses on the first three chapters of the book of Genesis. Now, remember, Genesis 3 is where the serpent comes in and gets Eve to go against God's, God's commandment. And so that, that's an interest to me. I want to see what the Kabbalah says. But, but the whole idea of this book is, is that what you plainly read in Genesis 1, 2, and 3 is not the real meaning of it. That there is a secret, hidden meaning in Genesis 1, 2, and 3 that's not written in the text. That's a setup. That's a lie. That's mystery religion. Okay? My interest in it is, I want to know what they say that God supposedly is keeping a secret, and God's not revealing it to everybody. But this is, this is what God said. God said, Hear you this, I've not spoken in secret from the beginning, from the time that it was, there am I. I've not spoken in secret. Everything that I've said, I've made plain. I've even had my guys write it down so that there was no misunderstanding what I said and what I didn't say. John 18, 20, Jesus, and by the way, I like this. Because what you have here is proof that Jesus is the Lord God. Because God said, come ye near unto me, hear you this, I have not spoken in secret from the beginning. John 18, 20, Jesus answered him, I spake openly to the world, I ever taught in the synagogue and in the temple where the Jews also always resort, and in secret have I said nothing. He is the Lord God who does not speak in secret. Wow, I love that. I don't know how the Jehovah's Witnesses get around that, but I'm pretty sure they do. But clearly, whether it's in the Old Testament or whether it's in the New Testament, there is no secret doctrines. There's no mystery doctrines that are actually there. You know, you have the black letters on the page. Well, God's real secret is in the white space between those lines. You know, we call it reading between the lines. Hey, I'm reading between the lines here. Well, Technically, there's nothing there. Okay? So, here is Jesus saying, I'm not reading between the lines. I'm not speaking between the lines. I'm giving you the lines. In secret, have I said nothing? It's mystery Babylon who speaks 
everything in secret and then says, we'll put your trust near to ear if you ever tell anybody what you heard and saw inside this Masonic Lodge. We'll cut you open. You go to the Bilderberg meeting and they swear secrecy that they cannot reveal anything that they heard inside that meeting. And God, God is against mystery religion and secret meetings. And I'll tell you this, JFK was a fornicator and an adulterer and a Roman Catholic and not a very good one at that. But he made a speech. Whereby, and you can hear this on YouTube, John Kennedy made a speech blasting secret society. He said it is the exact opposite of, the, of what a free people desires when you have men in power holding meetings in secret. It's like Obama and Hillary telling everybody to vote and pass the health care bill, but not giving them the chance to read what was in the health care bill. They didn't want them to read it. They just wanted them to vote on it. That's against our principles, people. Daniel 2.22. By the way, the number 22 is the number for Revelation. He revealeth the deep and secret things. He knoweth what is in the darkness, and light dwelleth with him. There's nothing you keep secret from God. There's nothing that the Freemasons keep secret from God. There's nothing that the Bilderbergs keep secret from God. There's nothing that the Rockefellers and the Trilateral Commission and the New World Order and the Illuminati and the Vatican and Eric, there's nothing that is hidden from God. And God is the one through His Word that revealeth deep and secret things. So, you're going to read morals and dogmas. How are you going to know what they're talking about because they won't reveal the secret? How can you know what's being written in the Kabbalah books or these Freemason books or whatever? How can you know what is written when they're not going to reveal the secret? You're going to read the Bible and let God reveal the secret to you. So, in verse 30, Daniel said, But as for me, the secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living. Daniel said, Who am I? It's not that, you know, I was trained in all the mystery schools and I learned all the secret doctrines and the handshakes and the, and the secret symbols. And it's only because of that that I know this. Daniel said, It's not, not because of me. He said, But for their sake, that shall make known the interpretation of the king and that thou mightest know the thoughts of thy heart. God's going to do this, King, not me. Surely, Amos 3 7. You, you underline this in your Bible. Surely the Lord will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servant, the prophet. Now, my friends, I'm here to tell you his servants, the prophets, have already written everything down for us. Do not believe latter day prophets. Don't believe them. I used to. I used to listen in days gone by to the club of prophecy. And they would put out a man by the name of Demetri Dudeman, a Romanian pastor that came to America that said that he had all these angel visitations and God gave him all these visions of what's going to happen. And they said it was going to happen before the year 2000. None of them did. Not one of them came to pass. I said, that's a pretty bad score. When you're supposed to be a prophet and God supposedly supposed to give you visions and dreams and yet not one of them come to pass, that's that's pretty bad. You see, I used to believe that stuff. And I would ask God, God, how come you don't give me dreams and visions? How come you don't make me a prophet like these guys are? God, God, give me dreams and visions. And every time I would pray that, God would say, Mike, open your Bible. There's dreams and visions right there. You want dreams and visions? They're right there. And after about the third time praying that, I said, God, I will not ask you for this ever again. What I will ask you to do is to show me what is plainly written in your Word. 
that's what I'm going to believe, and that's what I'm going to declare to people. Not stuff that I dreamed up, but what you've already revealed in your Word. My friends, do not believe Latter-day Prophets. Don't trust them. You're not obligated. They're going to be wrong at least one time. And if they're only wrong one time, according to Deuteronomy 18, you don't have to listen to them ever again. Because God's, God's method of determining whether or not a prophet is telling the truth and that he's from God is that he's never wrong. And if he's wrong, if he gives a hundred prophecies and 99 of them come to pass, if he's wrong one time, he's not from God. Somebody asked me the question the other day, do I believe that devils can see the future? And my answer to that is, yes, in a limited way. Look at it like this. Um, us humans are higher than dogs and cats and monkeys. Okay? God made us higher intellect, higher stature than them. Dogs and cats and monkeys cannot predict their future even three seconds ahead. They can't do that. They have no capacity whatsoever to judge what is going to happen. We, as humans, I can say that in the next ten seconds, I'm pretty sure I'm going to be still talking. And lo and behold, ten seconds later, here I am still talking. Okay? So, in a very limited way, we can see into the very near future. Angels, whether they be devils or angels, they are higher than us. And if you get higher, you can see higher. You can see more. And I think that even devils have a limited ability to foretell the future. Now, they're not right 100% of the time. God won't let them be. But remember who God is. God is the most high, meaning that God can see everything. God sees all of human history, past, present, and future, as if it's all taking place all at the same time. God sees it all, and God is never wrong about what He sees going on in the future. So even devils can inspire the minds of astrologers and soothsayers and fortune tellers and so on in a limited way to maybe foretell of an event that's going to take place tomorrow. But then again, maybe these same devils, after telling some soothsayer or astrologer, hey, you're going to get the car wreck tomorrow about 10 o'clock, those same devils know how to cause a car accident that involves you about 10 o'clock the next day. So maybe that's self-fulfilling. But God is the only one who can see 100% of the time in the future. And He can see everything, and He's never wrong. And so the prophets that you have in your Bible, they are right. They're right 100% of the time. And God is not going to do anything that's not written in this book. Jesus himself said, Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. This Bible is the DNA of the future. It tells out and spells out and proclaims the things that are going to happen because God has already seen them happen. Every choice that you make. And, and even if you... Let's say that, oh, I can't even give an illustration. You flip a coin, you call it heads, it lands heads. Well, you got lucky that time. But God knew it was going to land heads. God knew it. And you, so you might say, well, what if it came up tails and God said it was heads? God wouldn't say it was heads. God would say it was tails. 
God's never wrong ever about the future. And He has already revealed your future to His prophets. And they've already written it down. And I just, I am encouraging you, Facebook and YouTube is full of Latter-day Prophets who say that God is giving them visions or God is giving them extra-biblical prophecies about things that are happening. I don't believe them. And I'm not going to be held accountable for not believing them either. I believe what God said in His Word, but I don't believe what that guy said. I don't care who it is. Matthew 13. All these things spake Jesus unto the, on the multitude in parables, and without a parable speaking not unto them, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables, I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. Yes, in the Old Testament, Jesus was a secret. He wasn't revealed back then. But when He came in the four Gospels, He was perfectly revealed. And then we, who are now on the other side of Calvary, with our New Testaments, we can go back in the Old Testament and we can see Jesus there in every story and in every page. He was there, he was there the whole time. But they didn't know it. So Jesus speaks the parables, but He also gives the interpretation of those parables. Here's another 22 for you. That's it. For there is nothing hid which shall not be manifested, neither was anything kept secret, but that it should come abroad. Now, what does that apply to? Does that only apply to Bible prophecy? No. Everything that you are trying to keep secret, God already knows it. Everything that you do in private, everything that you do in secret, God was standing right there watching you the whole time. And God, as a faithful witness, will come to you privately and say to you, I saw what you did. Would you like to repent? That's the Holy Ghost. And if you're smart, you'll repent because as you read the Word, God's going to reveal you and who you are to you so that you can't even lie about yourself anymore because the truth of who you are is written in the Word of God. There's nothing hid which shall not be manifested, neither with anything kept secret. I'll tell you this. I think it's highly probable that the prosperity gospel preachers like Ken Copeland, Benny Hinn, I think it's highly probable that those guys are adulterers. They have eyes full of adultery. They cannot cease from sin. Now, do I have photographs of this? Do I have video of it? Do I have, you know, first-hand witness testimony that saw... Jim Copeland going into a hotel room with some sleazy? No. I just know what the Bible tells you who these guys are and what they do. The Bible reveals it to you. So when I see Benny Hinn and Paula White holding hands going into a hotel room in Rome, that's no secret. That's no secret. That's no big deal. God said, God said in His Word that they have eyes full of adultery and cannot see from sin. I mean, it's there. And you can know you can know those people who qualify as false prophets and false teachers. You can know what they're doing without even being there. You can know what they're doing. Because God reveals it all. Romans 16, Now to him that is of power to establish you. The word establish has the word stable in it. Stabilize. Static. Unmovable. Now, to him that is the power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest, made manifest by the gospels and the New Testament. And by the scriptures of the prophets, 
according to the commandment of everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. How is it that we are to make known to all nations so they can obey the faith? How are we supposed to make that known to them? By teaching them fables and myths and Harry Potter and, you know, Harry Potter's really Jesus? You know, because Harry Potter's the good guy and he does good things? No. No. We're supposed to do it by the scriptures of the prophets. That's how we are to make known to the world what is happening now and what is going to happen. Anybody who is going to teach prophecy or declare things of a prophetic nature. If they're not doing it with the Word of God, they're not doing it. If they're not giving Scripture, they're not telling the truth. That's all there is to it. When we make known to the nations the commandment of the everlasting God so that they can be obedient to the faith, when we are to make known to those people we're to use the Scriptures to do it. The Scriptures of the Prophets. If we're going to reveal mysteries and secrets, let's do it with the Word of God and nothing else. 1 Corinthians 2. You've heard this phrase, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love Him. And it's true. Outside of the Bible, we don't have the first clue what heaven's like. We have no idea what awaits us on the other side. But, look at verse 10. There's a but there. But God has revealed them unto us by His Spirit. And what is His Spirit? His Word. That's His Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. You know I, that phrase, all things? I love that phrase. Think of a verse in the Bible that has the words, all things in it. And the phrase, all things, will, all, I would say, almost always point you to the Bible. The Bible is the book of all things. I can do all things through Jesus Christ our Lord. Right? For the Spirit searches all things. Yea, the deep things. Oh, let, let's do that. Let's do that. Let's, let me get my, let's type this in. All things. 220 times. Remember, 22 is the number for Revelation, right? First um, John two twenty. Look at there. But you have an unction from the Holy One, and you know all things. Think Bible, people. It means Bible. First John two twenty seven. But as the same anointing teaches you of all things. First John three twenty. For our, if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. <laughs> I love this. <laughs> oh man. Uh, Second Peter one three, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. <laughs> oh my goodness. But above all things, my brethren, swear not. But the end of all things is at hand. Think about the Bible. Uh, let's see. Wherefore in all things it behooved in me to be made like unto his brethren. Um Hebrews 1, 2, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, who may have appointed heir of all things, by whom he made the world. And so just take that phrase, all things, go all through the Bible, 220 verses, which means you'll miss a little bit of television, but it'll be worth it. Okay? Anyway, uh, what God's saying is here is it's not entering into the heart of man what God's prepared, but those things are revealed to us 
even the deep things of God, by the Spirit of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man, but the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God knows everything. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are, look at this, freely given to us of God. Now, God has given me wonderful things, and I will teach them to you for your love gift of $395, a one-time gift of $395 plus $50 postage and handling. I will, I will give you my DVD set on how I know all things. So that's what the that's what the wolves do. That's what the false prophets do. They have these so-called revelations, and they're not going to give them away. Oh no, they're going to sell them. They're going to tell you that you have to have this knowledge. You need this information. You need this anointing. You need this teaching. But if you don't have the money, you're not getting it. I'm not doing this for free. I'm taking that right now. Folks, that's a setup. That's a sure sign you're dealing with a wolf, a false teacher, a false prophet. He, he builds you up on some big thing that you've got to have, and then he's going to charge you out the no for it. Because if you call their office and say, I don't have any money, can I get this anointing? Sorry. Verse 13. Which things also we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches. Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. That means if I'm going to teach something from one part of the Bible, then I have to use another part of the Bible to do it. You don't step outside of the Bible to teach something in the Bible. Uh, Tim LaHaye, uh, when he got rich and famous, from the Left Behind series, and he did get rich. They um, they asked him. They said, "Why don't, why don't we um, this old commentary that you wrote on the Book of Revelation that you wrote years ago that nobody paid any attention to? Why don't we repackage that with the Left Behind logos on it and sell it?" And so they did, and he made quite a bit of money off that. So my wife bought me a copy of it years ago. This back before we knew anything. Like a birthday present or something like that. It was the Tim LaHaye Left Behind commentary on the book of Revelation. And at the time, I was studying Revelation uh, 10 and the Mighty Angel. And the part there in Revelation 10 where it talks about the um, the seven thunders uttered their voices. And I, John, was about to write, and the angel said, don't write what these seven thunders said. So John said, okay, I didn't write it. In Tim LaHaye's commentary, this is what he said. He said, now, the seven thunders are the seven stages of the rise and fall of the Roman Empire. And I'm going, where did you get that? Where is that in the Bible anywhere? Well, it's not. What he did was he read some book that some guy wrote, and this guy split up the rise and fall of the Roman Empire into seven stages, and Tim LaHaye read that, and he said, I'll put that in my book. That looks good. Now, how in the world do I know that the rise and the fall of the Roman Empire had exactly seven stages to it? Maybe it had three. Maybe it had 20. Maybe it, maybe it just had two, right? No, maybe that was it. 
But what he did was he stepped outside of the Bible to explain something in the Bible. And you'll go wrong every time you do that. Use the Bible to interpret the Bible. Don't use archaeology. Don't use commentaries. Don't use anything else. Let the Bible say what the Bible says. We don't even, we're not even supposed to interpret Scripture. Interpretations belong to God. Let the Bible interpret the Bible. Let the Bible shed more light on what the Bible says. That means read here a little and read there a little and read this over here and then read this precept over here. And then God will begin to reveal things to you. Um, yeah, here we go. Belief in false doctrine. Where does it come from? It comes from sinful lifestyles. And how can I say that? Isaiah 28, Woe to the crown of pride to the drunkards of Ephraim, whose glorious beauty is the fading flower which are on the head of the fat valleys of them that are overcome with wine. And Isaiah 28 talks about the drunkards of Ephraim and what it was that made them go wrong, that made them misinterpret what God was saying. It was their sin that did that. Your sin will dictate to you what you believe about the Bible. Um, and remember what, um, let's go back to First uh, Peter chapter 2, because he says that there, um, about the stone that they rejected, um, Verse 8, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word being disobedient. Being disobedient to God will cause you to stumble at the word, and then you'll believe things that are not true. What you do determines what you believe, and what you believe determines what you do. And sin can corrupt. Bible doctrine in your heart. It's like the thorns that choke out the Word. And what are the thorns? The cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust of other things. And a life full of sin and willful disobedience to God is going to make you think things that are not true. They have erred through wine and through strong drink are out of the way. The priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink. They are swallowed up of wine. They are out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision. They stumble in judgment. It's their sin that causes them to believe things that are not true. Just like staggering drunks. Cannot drive a straight line. Can't walk a straight line. For all tables are full of vomit and filthiness so that there's no place clean. And God, look at verse 9. God is looking for people to teach. Are you teachable or do you know it all? One of the things that I had to do, I felt like God was leading me to do it, but... I kind of thought that I came up with it on my own, but I know now I didn't. But what I told God 20 some odd years ago was that I would then try to forget everything that I believed to be true about prophecy. And then I would then let God fill in the blanks the way God wanted them filled in. I would let God teach me. I would let God show me. So, the first thing I did was I threw out the rapture. And I said, God, is there going to be a rapture? Answer that one first. And then, God, why is there not a rapture? Or why is there a rapture? 
But I just decided I didn't know anything. Because if you go to God and say, God, I already know it all. You know what I used to do? I'm not kidding you. I would get a book on Bible prophecy by Tim LaHaye or Greg Jeffrey or whoever. And when it came to what Grant Jeffrey was saying, I would read every word that he said. When he got to the scriptures, I would skip that. Because I would say, I already know what the Bible says. I want to know what they say. I was so wicked back then. Now, when I get a book, first thing I do is find out what scripture they're using. And then, no matter what they say, if they can't back it up with Scripture, I'm not interested. But, if they use Scripture, I'm more inclined now to only read the Scriptures that they're using. I got a book years ago on geocentricity. The idea that everybody used to believe a long time ago was that the Earth is at the center of the universe. I believe it. But at the time, I'm just going, what is this, flat earth stuff? I ain't going to read this. And I picked it up one day. And I saw what it was, and I decided right then not to read what the guy was saying. I wanted to read the scriptures that he used to support what he was saying. And when you read 20 or 30 or 50 verses out of the Bible, and they're all saying the same thing, if the earth established that it cannot be moved, the sun go within his circuit, then you start thinking maybe maybe the earth is at the center of the universe. And I I am a believer in geocentricity. But not because of what this guy said in a book. I didn't read much of what he said. I read the scriptures that he used. That's all I needed. That's all I needed was just the scriptures. And when I saw what the Scripture says, I can't refute that. I can't deny it. So anyway, whom shall he teach? God is looking for people that he can teach knowledge to, Bible knowledge. And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Then that are wean from the milk and drawn from the breast. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. That means God's going to give you a piece of it here. And I say a little piece in First Samuel a little piece of it in Matthew, part of it in 1 Corinthians, a little bit in the book of Revelation. In other words, you're going you're to have to read around the Bible to really get it, to really understand it. Search not just one book in the Bible, search the Scriptures. So God says, for with stammering lip and another tongue, stammering lips is Moses, another tongue is Greek. Will he speak to this people? To whom he said, This is the rest wherewith you may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. But the word of the Lord was unto them precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little, that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. God set up Israel for a fall because he gave them stammering lips. And then he gave them another tongue. And out of all the people in the whole world who don't understand the Bible, the Jews are at the top of the list. And I love the Jews. And they're very wicked, vile, nasty people, very arrogant people. Their religion is nothing but pure, hellish doctrines of devils, mystic, Kabbalah, and a Christ religion. And yet, God is going to save a remnant of those people in the last days. You've got to love them. So, and we studied this here a while back. Wine and strong drink is symbolic, symbolic of false teaching and misunderstanding, false doctrine. Do not drink, this Leviticus 10, 9, do not drink wine or strong drink. Thou nor thy sons with thee when you go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die. These shall be a statute forever throughout your generations, so that you may put difference between holy and unholy, between clean and unclean. See, if you don't, if you drunk physically and spiritually, then you won't be able to tell the difference between holy and unholy. 
Here's the Bible. What does it say right there? What does that say? Holy Bible. And you can read four different translations, and you'll say there's not really a difference between them. Mm. Uh, you're saying that because you're drunk. You can't tell the difference between holy and unholy. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. Whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Look at the words here. Wine is strong drink. Deceived. And you're not wise if you're drinking out of Babylon's cup. You're foolish. Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it gives its color in the cup, when it moves itself aright. At the last it biteth like a serpent, stingeth like an adder. Thine eyes shall behold strange women, think of Babylon, and thine heart shall utter perverse things. Like Ed Young Jr. saying, sex is worship. Sex is worshiping God. You're a pervert. I hit the wrong button. I hit my gun button. I meant to hit my poker button. These people are perverted. They are drunk. They're full of false doctrine. And I'll just, listen, I'll just lay it out. I've said this before. Any pastor, preacher, whatever, that for some reason is strangely, he seems to be emphasizing issues of sex a lot in his sermons. I guarantee you that guy's doing stuff in the closet that he doesn't want everybody to find out about. But you see, that's what's in his heart, and whatever's in your heart, it comes out of you. And when you've got preachers that, for some reason, they just can't stop talking about man-woman relationships, there's something wrong with that guy. I'm telling you, there's something wrong with that guy. Ephesians 5.18, be not drunk with wine. Where, When the guy, when the preacher, this happened years ago, he said that God told him to start doing Bible study at Hooters restaurant. Yeah, I'm not kidding you. He started doing Bible studies at Hooters. And he justified it. Well, we're out here where the men are. We're out here with men. We're out here with the sinners. And we're trying to reach them with the gospel. No. Uh, I get it. I get it. I know, there's another reason why you're at Hooters, and it doesn't have anything to do with the gospel you program. Anybody can see through that. Ephesians 5.18, Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Kenneth Hagin, Kenneth Hagin actually changed this verse in front of everybody. Because he's teaching them how to be drunk in the Spirit, and he says... And the Bible says, be not drunk with wine, where it is it says, but be you filled, be you drunk with the Spirit. He added, he added words to it. Added words, added words that said, be you drunk with the Spirit. That's not what it says. The Bible says, be sober, not be drunk. That ought to tell you something right there. And when the man's got to add something to the Bible in order for you to believe what he's saying, he's not telling you the truth. That guy was a perpetual drunk, and it would not surprise me a bit if he didn't have if he had a jug of whiskey within arm's reach everywhere he went. Wouldn't surprise me if I learned that tomorrow. Wouldn't surprise me. Or Robert, no, Richard Roberts. Richard Roberts went around telling everybody to be drunk in the spirit. Causing people to be drunk in the spirit, acting like he's drunk in the spirit, then on his way home he gets pulled over for driving under the influence of alcohol, driving while intoxicated. The man's a real drunk. First Thessalonians five, but ye brethren are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. 
We are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, no, let us not sleep as do others. But let us watch and what? Be sober. Show it to me in the Bible where it says we're to be drunk. Show it to me. Show me the verse. Show me the doctrine that says that when we're under the influence of the Holy Spirit, we're drunk. No. It's just the opposite. When you're under the direct influence of God's Holy Spirit, you are lucid, you are sober, you are in your right mind. All these experiences that are going on in the churches everywhere, that is nothing but Babylonian harlotry spirit. A drunken spirit from mystery Babylon herself. It is the other spirit that Paul warned us about. That spirit will never draw you to the Word of God. It will draw you away from the Word of God. You will be chasing down an ecstatic experience, which is a replacement for reading and believing the Bible. Satan hates the Bible. So does Mystery Babylon. So does Jezebel. And so they're not going to lead you to a further examination of Scripture. They're going to lead you away from it. So they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. These are the ones right here. They that sleep in the night, these are the ones that have their pineal gland activated. When the pineal gland is activated, you go to sleep. And yet they call it an awakening. We need to activate your third eye. We need to go through the seven chakras and activate your pineal gland so you can have an awakening. But wait a minute. The pineal gland is what makes you go sleep. Do they call light darkness and darkness light? Good, evil, and evil, good. The part of forehead was the name. Mystery. There it is right there. You just stop right there. Her name is Mystery. In every secret society, Every mystery religion, every religion that has secretive meetings and secretive teachings is under her direct control. They have meetings that people off the street are not allowed to attend. In the Mormon church, it's the uh, the temple ritual. When um, my friend Bradley from when he was in Mormonism, I asked him, I said, can you, there's a Mormon temple up in uh, West St. Louis County, right by Missouri Baptist University. And I said, can you get me in there? I'd like to see what's in there. And he said, I can't even get in there. I said, what do you mean? He said, getting in that building is by invitation only. And it's only granted to those that they trust are not going to reveal what's going on inside of them. And that's what I said, Bradley, you need to come out of her. That's a mystery religion, and you know it. Anywhere, any place where they will not reveal all of their doctrine, that's a mystery religion. Any place where they have secret meetings, that nobody else can attend that same mystery Babylon church or society. Any secret society with a secret that they're not allowed to tell anybody that's not part of their group, that's a mystery Babylon cult. There is not one thing in Bible Christianity that we cannot go out into the streets and proclaim to the world, I'm doing it now. I don't restrict who's allowed to listen in on my little talks every week. Because as far as doctrine is concerned, I have nothing to hide. I'm going to tell you what I believe. You ask me, I'll tell you what I believe. This is what I believe right here. According to the scriptures, this is what I believe. There are no secret doctrines that we have. Uh, let's see. Can I find this? No. It's out in the other room. 
I have a copy of the Apocrypha. And I, and I can't remember exactly where it is, but I've read it before. There's a portion where God is telling Jeremiah, Jeremiah, you need to gather a bunch of scribes. So he gathers all these scribes. And he tells these scribes, start writing down what I give you. And when they're all said and done, he takes some of the manuscripts that were written by the scribes, and he says, guys, take this, go out into the streets, and publish what I just told you from God out to the streets, and publish it everywhere so that everybody can hear it. But then there was a group of, of manuscripts that he had had those guys transcribed that he said was from God, and he said, these right here, we can't tell everybody out on the street. Only I'm only supposed to tell the elite, the initiated ones, the the wise ones are the only ones who can know what God says in these manuscripts. That right there gives you evidence that the Apocrypha is all about mystery Babylon the Great, because it teaches that. There is an elite group of people, and they are the only ones who are allowed to know the real secret. I guarantee you, I guarantee you, there's some cardinals in the Vatican and high-ranking Vatican officials that actually know the truth about who they really worship in the Catholic Church. They have access to secret documents that have never seen the light of day. And they're not about to reveal it. But I believe that there are men who openly worship Lucifer himself. But they do it in secret. Guarantee you. Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations the earth. And I saw the woman drunken. There it is. With the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. When I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Now, the opposite of that is what we believe, Second Peter 1. We have a, also a more sure word of prophecy. Wherein do you do well that you take heed as into a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star rise in your heart? In other words, what he's saying is, we have the Bible, and we're going to carry this with us every day of our life, and we're going to believe it, we're going to read it, we're going to study it. We're going to think on it. We're going to meditate on it. But in the day, when the day star arises and the day star is Jesus, when he arises with healing in his wings and we are transformed, we're not going to need this book anymore. Because we'll have God's Word written into our hearts. It's not that God's going to do away with the Bible and say, we don't need that in heaven. It's just that we won't need to read it from the book. It will be in our hearts, which is actually better, because when it's in your heart, you don't ever forget it. There's things in the Bible that I will read, and I will say, you know, I've read this verse a hundred times, and I just now saw that. But when I'm transformed, I will know even as I am known. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. Think about what that means. Number one, when it comes to understanding the Bible, no one man has the full truth of what God says. In other words, even the best of us are going to be wrong about something when it comes to the Bible. I am. I just don't know all the places where I'm wrong, because if I knew I was wrong, then I would change what would be wrong. Then I would believe what's right. But I don't, and I don't have the whole truth, and nobody does. Anybody who would say they do, they're lying through their teeth. Okay? So, number one, if we want understanding from the Bible, we have to get it 
from the Word of God so that it is a common understanding. Number two, when the King James translators translated the Bible, uh, let's see if I can find it here. They, you know, it says, you know, the authorized Bible translated out of the, yeah, translated out of the originals and with the former translations diligently compared and revised. Now, what does that mean? It means that the translators of the King James did not just use the Greek, the Hebrew, and the Aramaic manuscripts. They used also other translations of the Bible that had come before them. Why did they do that? You see, that is an accusation that those who uh, promote the modern Bible, they say, well, the King James translators, they used other translations because they didn't just stick with the Hebrew and Greek. They used other translations. That's right, they did. Why did they do that? Because no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. They knew that they were not allowed to come up with a completely unique translation of the Bible. They knew that what they were deciding, the Bible said to them in English, that God is no respecter of persons, and God's not, God's not going to say one thing in English and a completely different thing in Italian. So they compared what they were coming up with in English to what Martin Luther said in German, to what William Tyndale and John Wycliffe said, the Bible said, and they were comparing it with every other vernacular translation of the Bible that they had access to, to make sure that if God said it in English, God also said it in German, and God also said it in Italian, God said it in Latin, God said it in Bohemian, whatever. They knew they were not allowed to come up with a private interpretation. That's what that means. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of men. That just fell right there. Anybody who would say, well, man wrote the Bible. Man wrote the Bible. No. Man may have penned the Bible. But God is the author of it. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Now, uh, I'll throw this in, and I'm not trying to be mean with this. But remember who the devil went to first. Did he go to Adam or Eve? He went to Eve. Why did he go to Eve? The Bible says that the woman is the weaker vessel. And it was the woman that was deceived, not the man. So the devil went to the weaker vessel. And you'll notice that God does not say holy people of God's faith that they're removed by the Holy Ghost. That's not what he said. It was holy men. There are no female authors of the Bible. Why is that? Well, I think it has to do with the fact that the devil deceived Eve and the woman is the weaker vessel. But number two, every one of these men that God chose to write out his word themselves were a foreshadow of Christ or a type or a picture of Jesus somehow, some way. There is something about John and Paul and Moses and Elijah and Enoch and all of these other guys. There was something about them that manifested Jesus Christ in their lives. To the world, Moses was a lawgiver. Jesus is the new lawgiver. Okay? And you can look at every author of the Bible and there's parts of them that are an appearance of who Jesus is. In other words, all these men were acting the part of Jesus as they're writing out the words of God. And what, you know what's interesting to me? How many books of the Bible did Jesus physically with a pen write out? Zero. He didn't have to. He used these men 
to write out his words. They were going to testify of him. He was not going to testify of himself. That's pretty cool. I like that. Now, I have two columns here. We have a sure word and we have false doctrine. A sure word means no private interpretation. The Bible says it. The Bible means what it says. Do we really believe that the beast has seven heads? Or is that just a metaphor that, that John made up? I believe he has seven heads. And I believe he has ten horns on those seven heads. And I believe he has ten crowns. And I believe he has the feet of a bear and the mouth of a lion. And he has the, the spots of a leopard. And he, the dragon gives him his power to seek great authority. In other words, I believe every word about who the Antichrist is. I don't believe that's just metaphor. It is symbolic, but it's also substantive as well. So, I learned in Bible college that even though John said the beast had seven heads and ten horns, he was really writing about the Roman emperor. And we know that the Roman emperor didn't have seven heads and ten horns. So, if God said it, then it must be true. And the actual appearance of the Antichrist, the beast, he's going to have seven heads and ten horns. And there is no way out of that. Some have said to me, well, Pastor, you're confusing the literal parts of the Bible with the symbolic parts of the Bible. Am I? Is there such a thing? If God said the beast has seven heads, then I believe the beast has seven heads. That's what he looks like. I'll give you this, and I got blasted. I got blasted by a guy that all he does is make videos about everybody that he doesn't like and how everybody's not as smart and right as he is. Because, and I'll read it to you. Let me uh, get full face here. Psalm 91. You may have heard me say this. I'm sticking with it. I'm not changing my mind. The Bible says it, and I believe it. Does God have wings? Does God have wings? Psalm 91. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Does God have shadow? Yeah. Is God the Most High? Yeah. Is He the Almighty? Yeah. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. Is God our refuge? Yeah. Is God our fortress? Yeah. My God, in Him will I trust. Can I trust God? Yes. Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler. Is there a snare out there waiting for us? Yep. And from the noise and pestilence. Is one of those waiting for us? Yep. Verse 4. Read it. He shall cover thee with His feathers, and under His wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Now, do I believe that His truth is a shield? Yes, because one of the things that I fight with is a shield called faith. So, I believe that God's Word is a shield to quench all the fiery darts of faith. Literally. But can I say that God has wings, or is that is that a metaphor? And it doesn't here. And I want you to think about this. Think about your answer. Can we really believe that God said something, but that He doesn't really mean what He said? I mean. Can we believe that God is like us 
where we will say things that are really not true. Because that's what men do. Men say things and they're not really true. Men exaggerate or men use metaphors that are not real. But can we really say that God says things that are not true? Now, if he would have said, he shall cover you with his body as a mama bird covers her nest, then that's a metaphor. That's a symbolism. The word as is the key here, but it doesn't say that. He shall cover thee. If, if it would have said, he shall cover thee as a mama bird covers her young with her feathers, then I would say, no, the Bible doesn't say God has feathers. It just says he's covering us the way a bird does her nest. But that's not what it says. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. So do I believe that God has wings? Well, yes, I do. And here's why I believe it. Matthew 3.16 When Jesus when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were open unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, and lighting upon him. Mark 1.10, the straightway coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens open, and the Spirit, like a dove, descending upon him. Luke 3.22, the Holy Ghost descended in bodily shape like a dove upon him. The Holy Spirit is God. And the all the only form that we ever see the Holy Ghost being in is a dove. Does God have wings? I can't believe that He doesn't. The Holy when I say God, I am referring to the Holy Spirit. Okay, so I, I'm just saying. If God's Word says it, you're better off believing exactly what He said than you are trying to not believe what He said. Does that make sense? I think you're better off believing exactly what and how the Bible speaks. I think you're better off that way. I think it's better that we take God for His Word and that if God said it a certain way, then we just assume that God meant exactly what He said. Men like to exaggerate. Men like to say things that aren't really true. We like to exaggerate. We like to puff things up. We like to tell Fish stories. That the fish I called was that big. Actually, it was that big. Okay. But God doesn't speak that way. God's not a man. He's not like us. He speaks better than we do. God doesn't lie. He doesn't exaggerate. And if God says a certain thing, then I think you're better off believing exactly what God said, how God said it. And if people want to criticize you, and people want to laugh at you, and people want to mock at you and make a YouTube video on you and blast you to kingdom come, if people want to do that, I don't care. I don't care. You're not harming me. You're not hurting me. Laugh if you want. I believe what God says. And I I think the world would be a better place. I think the churches would be better. I think your home would be a better place if you just believe what God I think you'd be happier in life if you were trained by God to just believe what you I think 
I think life would be better. I think food would taste better. I think you'd be happier in your station of life if you just believe every word that you see in King James Bible. And instead of having a habit of disputing God's Word and saying, well, it says that, but it doesn't really mean that. I wonder what it really means. Instead of a habit of disputing God's Word, Thank you.